also our advisor for our undergraduate major and minors. And it's my pleasure to um, introduce you all to Dr. Carolyn Howard, this year's honored speaker for the annual Frederica Swears, Wild Swears um, Lecture on Women in Health. Um, uh, this lecture has been going on since 1981 when it was um, founded as a tribute to Frederica Wild Schwerz, the daughter of Jeannie Wild, who is here with us um, this evening. The lecture was uh, began established by Patricia Farnes, Dr. Patricia Farnes, who was the um, pathologist for Frederica. Frederica battled a 13-year um, battle with leukemia and passed away at the age of 16. So this um, was founded in her honor. And unfortunately, four years after the um, lecture series was begun, Dr. Farnes also passed away from cancer. So this is a very special event that we've been um, running every year since then to honor both of these women, as well as Jeannie Wilde, and um, dealing with the topic of women and health. <clears throat> um, also, we'd like to acknowledge the fact that Jeannie Wilde has been a strong activist in establishing supportive emotional health services for patients and their families um, at Hasbro's Children's Hospital here in Rhode Island. And tonight it seems most fitting that Dr. Carolyn Howard, with her extensive experience and commitment to women's health, be the person to help us carry on in this tradition of honoring such courage and inspiration. Dr. Howard is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine and completed her residency in obstetrics and gynecology at Yale New Haven Hospital. Um, from there, Dr. Howard went on to receive her master's in public health from John Hopkins University. Uh, School of Hygiene and Public Health, before working as a physician at hospitals in Maryland and Texas. While in Texas, she also served as an assistant professor at the Texas A&M University Health Science Center, where she was honored with the award Outstanding Clinical Faculty in Obstetrics and Gynecology. In 2003, Dr. Howard moved to Rhode Island, working first at South County Hospital before being hired as a gynecologist, gynecological consultant um, in the women's clinic here at URI. Since 2005, Dr. Howard has provided full-service gynecological care for URI's female population. Her experience in working with URI's diverse student population has brought her into contact with a wide array of cases and provided her with a nuanced knowledge of students' health needs. As one student remarked to me yesterday regarding Dr. Howard, she's just the best, period. As a passionate supporter for women's health, Dr. Howard has made it her personal mission to empower students with the necessary information they need to make the best choices for their own personal health. It is Dr. Howard's commitment to educating her patients that makes her a top-notch doctor. Um, but even more so, it is her desire and ability to see her patients as individuals and to treat them with respect and dignity that makes her a compassionate individual and a tireless advocate for women's health. Given the current political climate and debates over funding and programs for reproductive health, it is not only seems timely, but imperative that we have discussions like this one that we'll be having this evening. Dr. Howard's talk is going to be on your own reproductive health, what you should know, and questions you need to ask when visiting the gynecologist. And this draws from her experiences working here at URI and will address women's reproductive health throughout the life cycles. She also looks forward to opening up the discussion to those of us here in attendance in a question and answer period that will be held after her presentation. So without further ado, it is my great pleasure to honor and introduce to you Dr. Carolyn Howard. Jennifer said, I am uh, passionate about obstetrics and gynecology, and especially since my time here, I've actually come to understand the importance of um, empowering women of all ages about what they need to know and um, how to take care of your reproductive health, because it's not necessarily something that you think of until you're ready maybe to have become um, mothers and have children that you might start to say to yourself, oh, well, you know or when you're ready to go to the gynecologist, many students come in, and I've observed this over the few years that I've been here, that they'll come in at 18 and um, they're unaware and, un, you know, they, they are interested in finding out, and by the time they're ready to leave at 21, they're telling me, okay, and I want this and I want that, and I love it, because that's what we're here for. I'm here to tell you what you need to know so that you can take that information 
and use it to make choices that work for you. So we'll start first by just simply going over. I think I'm going to have to. Going over what we're going to be talking about today. So, as Jennifer says, the first thing I'll start by going over, and the, for those of you who are very familiar with this process, it may be a little mundane, but I think it's still important. Never hurts to hear it once one more time. But we'll talk about. Um, the, what's called the annual GYN visit, the visit that you come to see us for once a year. That's a comprehensive evaluation of um, women. We focus especially on your gynecologic history, but we also want to be aware of what's going on with the rest of you because that could have an impact on your reproductive uh, health. The other thing I'm gonna do is since many of the patients that I see are in their late teens, early to mid 20s, um, we're going to focus on specific concerns for young women, especially the kinds of issues that um, women come in for and have concerns about, um, one of them being contraception and the other being um, sexually transmitted diseases. And then finally, I actually was talking with a colleague of mine at the health services and he says, I hope you're talking about HPV. And I said, okay. So I threw that in there because I realized that that is probably the most frequently asked question I get. What is HPV? Do I have it? How do I get rid of it? So we'll get to that as well. Um, so the annual gynecologic exam, you know, actually, Jennifer, could I get a pointer? I'm sorry, I just thought of that. Um, I'll keep going, but at some point I have um, images and I want to sort of point out. Yeah, okay, sorry. Um, so the annual visit has to, um, as we said before, occurs once a year. and. It's broken down into three compartments. In fact, whenever you go to see a physician for any reason, um, we sort of use the same format, the same model. We need to talk to you to figure out what's going on. Actually, it starts with when you first come in. We observe whether or not you're sitting quietly, whether or not you're happy, maybe you're sad. So we're making notes mentally about what state of mind you might be and whether or not you're anxious. And then we also want to speak with you and gather information about uh, your general health, issues that you may have um, worked with throughout your life, um, your gynecologic health, as well as, and then finally, your psychosocial health. <clears throat> we also will then move to the physical exam. And at, again, we do a complete or comprehensive or general physical, but then we definitely focus on uh, breast and the pelvic examination. And it's the pelvic examination that has that sort of mystique to many kids who've never been in there before. We'll get into that in great detail. And finally, we do some laboratory testing. Um, it used to be the guidelines were once women become sexually active, you need to have a pap smear. Um, however, that has been modified and we'll talk about the latest recommendations that are out there and the reasons for them. Um, so STD screening, and of course there are times that you need laboratory testing because um, you may have been identified as uh, having an issue that, that would need to be done. So for the history, the general health history starts with you know the reason for the visit. What is it that brings you in here? For many kids is I want to get started on the contraceptive pill. That's a relatively um, common reason for our students to come in and that makes them start thinking about well what is it that I need to be aware of and what do we need to do in order to get that done. Um, the second or the next part of this and recognize that you may not necessarily follow the format in the order that I'm presenting to it because as you're talking I'm getting information I'm putting it into these different categories in my head um, so you may start by telling me something which may jump me to something else but then we'll sort of go back and forth um, but health problems, health concerns, um, have you ever had asthma, are you a diabetic, um, do you have scoliosis, sort of the things that um, people um, may have been dealing with um, throughout their life or maybe even if it's a recent diagnosis. Medications, very important to talk to them not just about prescription medications but stuff that may have been um, picked up over the counter, what they're using it for. Um, and then for those that are um, interested in alternative uh, medications, having people bring their medications in is actually a very helpful tool because some of the stuff, though th these days with Google you can just get on a computer and pull it up right away and figure it out anyway, but 
Yeah, so we want to know everything. When I mention medications, I make it clear that we're not just talking about something that the physician has given to you. Have you ever been hospitalized? Have you ever had to have surgery? Have you ever um, been in an accident of any sort? That kind of thing. And then finally, we sort of review any area that may have been missed. Sometimes it may be relevant to what they're describing to us. So for example, women with um, pelvic pain, if they, thank you so much. Okay. Women with pelvic pain, if they're um, having problems with um, their gastrointestinal system, maybe constipation, diarrhea, things like that, it may actually have me sort of thinking in other terms other than just what they're mentioning. In terms of their gynecologic history, we get information, details. How old were you when you first started having your period? How often did you get them? What is normal for you? How many days do you bleed? Are you in pain most of the time? If not, if yes, um, what do you use for the pain uh, medication? Um, any previous pregnancies and what happened with the outcome? And any previous vaginal or pelvic infections? Um, if you've ever treated yourself with any of the over-the-counter uh, medications that are available, um, I've seen you know ads and once in a while I sort of go through the um, pharmacy section of many of these um, air, um, you know pharmacies just to make sure I know what's out there and sort of keeping tabs of what's new. Um, and then um, contraceptive status, are you um, on the pill? Do you use condoms um, if you're sexually active? And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, and are you interested in finding out more information about your options regarding that? Um, sexual practices, um, a very general question is, are you sexually active? But that can sometimes be uh, misleading or what I like to do is make sure that you're all on the same page. So the first thing I start with is um, sexual activity. How are you defining it? Are you defining it as oral sex? Are you defining it as vaginal intercourse? Are you defining it as rectal or anal sex? Because people have told me before that they are not sexually active, but that means that they're not having vaginal intercourse. However, they are having oral sex. Um, so, and that has its own risks, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. So you want to be very clear, make sure we're sort of all on the pa same page and understand specifically what you're talking about. And then if you've ever had any um, gynecologic surgical procedures, laparoscopy for any reason, um, I think I left out surgical history. We also want to know if you've had any surgery um, in the past. Have you had your tonsils removed? Have you had your appendix removed? That kind of thing. Then we move on to the psychosocial history. Um, family history, anyone who's had previous medical problems that could be heritable. Um, we also um, talk about, especially for uh, what we do, any family history of breast cancer is uh, particularly important. Um, any family history of diabetes, uh, the social history, any alcohol, any cigarette smoking, any marijuana use, um, any other drug use. Uh, diet and exercise, I know students, you guys, you know, that's probably at the bottom of the list, but we do talk about sort of what your eating habits are and what you're trying to do in terms of being able to, um, making sure, and actually walking up and down that hill, there's really, <laughs> that is a challenge, so exercise is not necessarily something that you have a hard time working into your daily schedule. Um, we also, um, I'm always on the lookout for the, as well for eating disorders, you know, people who may be binging and purging. Um, that can sometimes show itself as someone who comes in and doesn't want to get on the scale. That could be a first hint of a problem. Um, and depression, suicidal ideation, any of that is very important to talk. And that's where I talk about, you know, when the person comes in, are they sitting quietly? Are they what we call a flat affect? Are they sort of Blah, you know, just not really engaging with their environment or with life. Um, and then, very important, if it's, you know, not with every patient, but any history of sexual abuse or rape, and that sometimes can show itself in many different ways, and um, we definitely focus on that, because that's what we're there for. So in terms of the physical exam, um, obviously you have to get undressed, <laughs> and we have, um, paper gowns that we, wear, we have there for uh, students to put on. There, um, actually, there's one for the top half uh, for when we need to do the breast exam in case we don't need to do the complete exam. And that opens up in the front. We also have uh, 
the paper just to put on the lower part of the body so you feel reasonably clothed. I mean, we try to sort of be as discreet as possible in terms of that. Students are always educated that you have the right to have a chaperone. You don't have to be in there um, by yourself with the provider who's uh, examining you. Very often they bring their own support group with them so that, you know, they may have someone in there with them being able, I mean, they're just sort of su with, for support. Even if they're sitting behind the curtain, at least there's someone around. Um, the, before they come into the room, we get a weight and blood pressure and a height that allows us to calculate their BMI. Um, and then we'll do a um, general exam looking at their throat, palpating their neck for the thyroid, listening to their heart and lungs, an abdominal exam and a skin exam. And then we move on to the breast and pelvic examination. And those are highlighted because we're about to get into that in more detail. So for the breast exam, I like to educate students about what we are, um, well, the anatomy of the breast and what it is that we should be doing. And I almost always sort of have them take their hands and touch their breasts and make sure that they're able to feel the glandular tissue. Because as you can see, it's not cotton. It has a um, sort of a fine glandular appearance to it. And depending on where you are in your menstrual cycle, these can feel pretty scary sometimes if you do your own exam and you're not educated and aware of what you're supposed to be feeling. I tell them that, you know, this is sort of like, I think of it or visualize it as like a cobblestone pattern. And if you're feeling this and the consistency and the texture is all the same all the way throughout, then you're okay. The other hint or clue I give is if you feel something on the outer aspect of your breast, let's say you feel something there that's concerning, what you want to do is go to your other breast, in this case the left breast, and you want to look on the outer aspect of the left breast, and I'll demonstrate right here, so you go on this side and you'll palpate because if you feel that then symmetry is not malignancy or cancer in general, that's a reassuring sign. I always tell them if they have any questions, especially for palpating anything, you need to give us a call and come in, but at least that you can get started by doing that for yourself. Um, so the uh, glandular tissue sits on top of the uh, pectoralis muscle, which is deep to the breast, and the breast tissue has uh, ducts that drain out to the um, nipple and the areola, and so we just review that and make sure everyone is comfortable with that. And I'll show you here a breast examination that um, is being done. Um, the physician or a healthcare providers palpating in the axillary area to look for lymph nodes, very important. That's part of what we do. And we also are looking for symmetry of the breast, whether or not one is slightly larger than the other. And this one is slightly larger than that. And in general, for most women, that is the case. Um, so that is not considered an abnormality. And then I'll talk them through the way or manner in which, excuse me, we do the breast exam. And for the most part, I actually prefer to do a sort of a circular motion, starting here and sort of working your way out. But you can do any one of these methods. You can come from the um, outer edge of the breast tissue and come all the way in, or you can come sort of up and down uh, vertically, perfectly fine. The best time of the cycle to do your breast exam is right after you've had your menstrual uh, period. Um, because at that point, there's the least amount of hormonal influence on the breast tissue. This is a picture I got out of one of my textbooks uh, that actually shows, um, not very well, but at least it gives us an idea of uh, some of the abnormalities that you'd see um, in breast exams. Um, this one is pretty, um, has, is, it's actually a classic sign called peau d'orange, which is basically the breast, the skin looks like the skin of an orange because the, um, the glands within the um, breast, I mean within the skin have been made more prominent by edema that's underneath the skin and the edema is secondary to the malignancy. So you can see that appearance here. You can also see retraction over here a little bit above the nipple and in all Four of these, you're actually looking just for evidence of retraction right in there, adjacent to the nipple. And here's actually tucking under um, the right nipple breast area. And then over here again, you can see it over in here. 
actually, sorry, over here, right there on that side. Maybe I can see better on this, yep, over here. So that's the breast exam. Then we move on to the pelvic exam. And what I have here is a, um, it's a sagittal section through the pelvis. So just imagine you've been sort of split down the middle and separated. <laughs> and we've also removed your bowel so that we can get a better visualization of your uterus, okay? So anatomically speaking, front to back, we're gonna start out here, and this is your pubic symphysis, the pubic bone that's right here. Right behind it sits your bladder, okay? And that drains, I mean, you urinate through your urethra, which is this tubular structure that's coming out. The uterus sits behind the bladder, which is why we have so many um, genitourinary as well as gynecologic concerns for women uh, when they come in to see us. And the uterus um, is, uh, the lower part of the uterus, and I'll show you this in another slide, is called the cervix, and that's the top of the vagina. So when we put the speculum in, and you'll see this in a few more slides, we're actually visualizing this structure, the cervix. We're also visualizing the vagina as well. And um, finally, in the uh, continuing to move towards the back, we've got the rectum, the pubic, uh, I mean the um, coccygeal bone, and then the buttocks tissue. And that's just another example of the uterus being removed. They've actually sort of elevated the ovary. You can't see the ovary here because it's lying on the other side, but we'll see in the next slide. Well, maybe not yet. So this is actually um, the external um, view of the vagina, and this is what we are evaluating when you come in to see us. And I really feel ever so strongly that we need to know um, our anatomy. We need to know what's connected to what and what does what. And you'd be surprised at how many students just don't have that information. So this helps me because I can now show you um, sort of the anatomy from top to bottom. So this is the pubic mons, or basically the area where the labia majora, the large lips, right, major, large, come up to converge on top to form the pubic mons. This structure here is the clitoral hood, also called the prepuce, as it's noted over here. And that area at the tip of it is the clitoris. And the frenulum is right underneath it. Um, the urethral opening is, can you see that at all? Yeah. The urethral opening is right underneath here. And it sits, as you notice, right on top of the vagina because the vaginal opening is this structure here. And these little sort of irregular appearing structures, that's the hymen. That's what covered the vagina prior to initiating sexual intercourse. So the vagina's here. The urethral opening is here, and the clitoris is here. The clitoris is actually at the top of the um, labia minora, you know, the smaller inner lips. So you've got outer larger lips, and then you've got inner smaller lips. And this struck, these two structures go up to join here. So whenever we're discussing um, whether or not there's maybe a bump or a growth that someone says, I usually get, oh, I don't know, somewhere down there. <laughs> it's like, okay, let's talk about where specifically. Um, this is the, um, basically, the, it has a separate name, it's called the fourchette. It's the entry point to the vagina, and a lot of times when women have irritation and discomfort, this area is usually fairly well affected, as you can imagine, because it's where the discharge or the natural secretions come from the vagina. And then we've got the uh, rectum or the anus. So that's, this is the, um, let me see, I think we'll go back to this first. Okay, so this is the um, instrument that we use to do the pelvic exam. It's called a speculum. For us, in the health services, we actually use disposable ones. They're plastic. Uh, these are metal and um, many, um, practices use this kind. Um, if you look at this speculum versus this, this is for one in, that we use in women who've never had children. The major difference is it's narrower in diameter, but you can also see that the end, the end is not, uh, is, 
is tapered. It's not flared like this one is. Um, so this is called a Graves speculum, and this is called a Peterson, and we use this Peterson primarily at over at Health Services. And that's what we see when we put the speculum in. I mean, this is pretty much the limit of what we can actually visualize. We can see the vaginal wall, which you can't really see with this um, image. But again, let me just orient you. This is the, um, the speculum in place. This is the cervix. You can see the opening, and that opening leads up into the uterus, and that's where you menstruate through, right, or from. And if we were able to sort of move this image around, we'd be able to see sort of like the right and then the left vaginal walls within. But that's a pretty healthy looking cervix in a young adult. So we do the pap smears um, from now on. We, I mean, from, for now we do it for, on women who are 21 and older. We're not offering it to um, students under the age of 21. I'll explain that to you in a bit more detail. But the pap smear is done with the speculum in place, okay? And you can actually see that um, they're uh, it's a two-step process. We have a spatula that's used to obtain cells on the sort of outer rim of the cervix. And then we get the brush or the side brush that you place and you rotate it in here at least 360 degrees. And that can sometimes be a little annoying or, you know, uncomfortable. Um, and the other thing we do is we, when we're screening for STDs with chlamydia and gonorrhea, we use uh, Q-tips. So as scary as it sounds, it's really instruments that are, you know, not excessively large that are being used to do this. So that's the first part of the pelvic exam. The second part of the pelvic exam we are using to now, remember I said we can only really see the cervix and the vagina, you can't really see, you know, you'd love to be able to just sort of, but we have to actually, we, we can't see internally. So what we do is we have to use our hands to appreciate where the uterus is. Is it tilted forward? Is it tilted backward? Do you get a lot of um, back pain with your menstruation? Sometimes that's a hint in the history, right? Or is it sort of just laying um, mid position? Um, so in this case, what we're doing is we're putting one or two fingers in the vagina, and then you have the patient relax their abdomen, and you try to just sort of Get that hand down there as far as you can to be able to feel the uterus. You want to know how large it is. Uh, you want to make sure there's no tenderness with examination. The next phase would be to feel um, for the ovaries, and those are um, a little bit more difficult to be able to find, but it definitely is doable. Again, with the fingers in the vagina, you take your hand and you start up in the pel um, right pelvic side wall and you sort of slide it down. And you can sometimes feel, and very often actually, feel them over, just sort of slip through between the fingers. That's helpful in trying to figure out pain. It could be that someone has an ovarian cyst, or uh, there may be something going on with one of the, um, we call that the adnexa, one of the ovaries, or maybe even the fallopian tube. Um, and that's my son taking a nap. So that's my point to transition into. <laughs> and you know, it's seven now, but it's so sad because he was the third kid and that's how he fell asleep many nights because we were so busy trying to get other things done. But okay, so let's go on to the, let's go on to the laboratory testing because the um, pap smear is one of the main screening tests that we get and I've had students tell me, oh, that means I don't have to come back next year because I don't need a pap smear. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'll explain to you why we don't need the pap smear done because the guidelines have changed, but you still need to come in because as you can tell, we do a lot more than just the pap smear. We're not just pap smear screening uh, tools. So anyway, in, 20, in the fall of 2010, ACOG, the American College, I didn't tell you what those initials are, the American College, of obstetrics and gynecology changed their guidelines for the pap smear screening. And this was after a lot of research had been coming out in the last 10 years about HPV and the role of HPV and sort of like the biology of what it does. Um, and their recommendation is to begin screening at age 21, not before, even if you're sexually active. Now understand that that change is hard for us as well. It's not just a transition for students or patients to make because 
there are many questions that come up because since we know that HPV is involved in this and since we know that um, sexual activity increases your risk for the likelihood of acquiring it, um, the question is, should someone who's initiated sex at 14 and has 20 partners by the time they're 21 not be screened, is that the same risk as someone who may have had only a couple of partners by the age of 21? And I think that that debate is out there, but we are sort of reserving the right to perhaps on a case-by-case basis decide whether or not it would be worth doing. But in general, if you go to your physicians, they're probably going to tell you that you don't need a pap until you're 21. Um, at 21, you're going to be screened, but you're not going to be screened every single year. You're actually going to be screened every other year. And at 30, you're actually going to be screened every three years, provided we have done the following. So you either have to have had a negative pap smear as well as an HPV. And if I'm if this is too confusing, please tell me where to clarify because I can do that for you. But the HPV is offered with the pap smear for women 30 and over. Up until that point, it's not done automatically. So if you have a pap smear or cytology that's negative and an HPV that's negative, you actually have about a 99 or 98% chance of being cancer-free for the next three years because that's how um, much the HPV is helpful in assessing this information. Um, for the other way you can do it is if your um, doctor is not sending your cytology to a lab that runs the HPV, they're just doing the pap smear. If you have three normal consecutive pap smears, you don't need a pap smear for another three years. Okay, So that's what's being recommended. Now, why do they do that? Well, there are many reasons, but probably the simplest way to sort of make this um, understandable to you is that the real risk for pap smear, for cervical cancer, there are actually two peaks for cervical cancer when you look at the, uh, the data. There's the peaks in the mid-30s, your mid-30s, and then there's, it peaks again in your mid-60s. And teenagers tend to have abnormalities with their pap smear caused by HPV that are transient and temporary. They sort of appear, they stay for a while, and then they resolve. And when you look at the data, and I had done this for another talk I'd given, and I remember looking at the most recent data that was available for uh, cancer statistics, and I think it was year 2002. But if you look at it, the rate or the risk for cervical cancer is um, fairly low in the 15 to 19 year old population. And for the data that I could review, they actually had a, um, a comment that there were, I think, nine cervical cancer cases that were picked up that year, and about five of them would not have been screenable or preventable by pap smear screening. Um, but we start at 21 because the um, risk, you know, increases about eightfold just from this age range to here. So that's one of the reasons that uh, the, the, um, it's being given. Now remember, physicians have the ability to sort of use clinical common sense and do what's required. So it's not set in as the absolute you must or you must not. But one of the problems or concerns that physicians have is, in general, whether or not the insurance companies will cover that, and that's a whole different discussion. But continuing with the laboratory testing, chlamydia and gonorrhea is highly recommended if you're sexually active. Um, HIV testing would be part of the uh, STD or sexually transmitted disease screening if re requested. And then there are additional tests that we could do based on what we figure out for um, risk factors or concerns, a hemoglobin level perhaps for someone who maybe have, has heavy periods and feels fatigued to see whether or not they're anemic. Maybe a glucose level for someone with a family history of um, glucose and concern with the risk for polycystic ovary and then cholesterol and um, HDL. We usually don't recommend those until about your early to mid 20s, but then that would be important to sort of follow on. Okay. So let's move along to, now that we've, you've, got, you've got an idea of what it is that we're screening and doing in the um, 
office, let's look at what specific concerns are out there for uh, young women. And very often they're coming in for contraceptive choices. Really what they're coming in for though, they're very interested in getting on the birth control pill because they are, most kids are using condoms as part of their repertoire, but um, sometimes uh, they, they, they sort of come to us when they're ready to think about using the birth control pill. Um, vaginal and pelvic infections, um, you can have infections that are not STD related, such as yeast or candidiasis, as it's called here, or a bacterial vaginal infection. And then you can also have um, STDs, and I just picked three of them because they're sort of the um, ones that are seen uh, with the most frequency over at health services. So in terms of contraceptive choices, well, clearly sterilization is not appropriate for our patient population. <laughs> it's up there just because it's the most common form of contraception for women and men, because it's including the men between the ages of 15 and 44. So reproductive age women use about 23% of them use sterilization as their form of contraception. But then the next on the list is the hormonal form of contraception, and the oral contraceptive pill is used by over 10 million women in the United States. It's about 17 to 18% of that reproductive age population, so it has the highest percentage of use of all forms of reversible methods of con contraception. And the pill works by inhibiting ovulation. It's as simple as that, you know. The there are two hormonal components um, in the combination oral contraceptive pill. There's the um, ethanol estradiol, which is the form of estrogen. It's the most common. There's also mestranol, another choice of estrogen, but it's estrogen and it's progestin. Those are the two hormones that are in there. And together what they do is they get the brain to suppress what its activity does in order to get the ovary to um, ovulate, to release an egg. Um, so it works by inhibiting ovulation. There are some, it is, it's, it's extremely successful. It has a very low failure rate, um, less than, I mean, 99.9% .9 success rate once taken properly. Um, we recommend you take it, or try to take it around the same time every day when you're gonna take it. Um, the problem is the real risk for failure is within the first year of use. I mean, there's a failure rate of about 7 to 8% within that um, demographic. Um, there is a downside to uh, the oral contraceptive pill, and that is your risk for DVT or thrombosis uh, within the lower extremities, um, and that's a clot in your um, veins is increased about three to four fold over the woman who is not taking the oral contraceptive pill, but it is half of what women experience when they get pregnant. So um, it's, <laughs> I know, go figure. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, you know, that's just the way it is. But estrogen is the uh, component within the pill that puts women at risk for DVTs. Um, there are other forms of uh, hormonal contraception, I'll just, touch on them br briefly, the transdermal patch. I've got a picture of that, and it truly is a combination, again, of estrogen and progestin, and it comes in a little uh, square patch that you place on one of, like, four or five places within the body. The vaginal contraceptive ring, I think I have a picture of that. So that's a, an example of um, oral contraceptives, um, and there are new ones coming out all the time. There are... I think they said there are 30 different types with, because, you know, the generic forms are available, I think there are about 80 different brands out on the market. Very often, though, when kids come in, they're like, I want blah 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 because you have friends, so that's how it works. <laughs> um, the vaginal contraceptive ring is a pretty neat little tool. It actually has, um, it, it is a ring, like the name suggests, and it, um, it's embedded with, again, estrogen and progestin. And what you have to do is you insert it into the vagina in a similar way that you'd place a tampon. So you squeeze it together and slide it in, and it stays there. It really does. 
and it stays there for three weeks and it releases this, you know, the required dose of hormone on a daily basis. You do need to sort of keep track of the calendar for this because it's not going to be sort of, you know, with the pill, you just push and pop, you know, push it and pop it. With this, you have to go, okay, wait a minute, has it been three weeks, four weeks? Because you want, you need to take it out at the end of the third week. And the following week, following week, you have a menstruation and then you get another one and you put it back in. Um, we also have, uh, we probably need to go back, ah, yeah, the other form of, um, oh dear, we need to fast forward. <laughs> There's also the uh, progesterone only pill, which um, doesn't work just by ovulation, but it works by thickening of the cervical mucus. And then there's the IUD, an intrauterine device, which we have, oh, that's the uh, patch, the transdermal patch. And then we have the intrauterine device, which is placed in the uterus. And for these two, one, this one stays in there for five years, that one stays in there for 10 years. Okay, so let's move on. Sexually transmitted diseases. So let's talk about the most common reportable, communicable STD called chlamydia. Um, there are about three million infections that occur annually. Um, it's a bacteria. It's very easy to diagnose and treat. It is so easy. It's gotten even better. You can actually just urinate in a cup and give us a sample if you don't want to have a pelvic exam. Um, it, the problem is, if it's not treated, it leads to such serious complications. And the majority of infections, and the reason that ST, this, this tends to be missed, is that the majority of infections are asymptomatic. People just don't know they have it. I mean, the numbers are actually higher than that, but I was thinking 70%, maybe I should, you know, I chose a reasonable range. But as many as two-thirds of women will have it and don't know it. We pick it up when we're screening for something else very commonly. Um, the highest at risk group in our population in the United States are our adolescent and young adults in the 20 to 24 range, age range. Their rates of having the infection, you know, on average is about 10%, between 5 and 14 and between 3 and 12. So what are the complications? Why do we care so much about this? Well, what happens is it starts out as an infection at the cervix, but then it allows, it's a gateway for problems to travel up into the upper um, pelvis, and it can result in something called pelvic inflammatory disease. And this is a huge healthcare cost to our society, actually. Because more than one million women develop PID a year, and about half of these are due to cases of uh, chlamydia being the, the uh, uh, organism that started it. You can end up with, um, what we call tubal factor infertility. So that's where you um, aren't able to conceive because your fallopian tubes have been scarred as a result of the infection. This can then lead to an ectopic pregnancy, which is a pregnancy in your fallopian tubes that is um, required to be managed either medically or surgically. You can have just pain, chronic pain. The infection's gone, but there's inflammation and scarring remaining as a result of that. You can, if, you're, if you have this while you're pregnant, um, you can have some adverse pregnancy outcomes. So this is an example of a healthy cervix on the left side of the screen. And then on the right side of the scene, you can see that purulent material coming out of the cervix that's uh, basically called an inflammation of the cervix or cervicitis. And that's an example of what might be seen. Notice I said might because you don't always see it when there's a symptomatic infection. So let's take a nice a look at um, what a normal pelvis looks like, and I'll just jump to, you know, you know the deal. This is the uh, uterus, ovaries, and fallopian tubes, right? And this is what it looks like when a student, a person has laparoscopy. So think of it as you're looking um, from the top of the patient because you're looking through the umbilical or belly button area. This is the structure in the middle, that's the uterus, okay? And you can see that this coming off of here and it sort of drapes nicely over the ovary, that's the fallopian tube. That's a nice, healthy, shiny looking pelvis. So then we take a look at what happens when you have uh, damaged or a fallopian tube that's got scar tissue. And this is an illustration that shows that. But if you come over here, it's a little hard to see, but what you notice is this fallopian tube 
the ends are clubbed. They're completely closed off. It's basically just a sack, and that's not good. The ovary's perfectly fine. The uterus looks okay, but this is completely closed. We can also see an example of what's called an ectopic pregnancy um, in both sides. Might be a little hard to see, but over here, this is basically a bulging or distension where the pregnancy is implanted. And over here, you can actually see this clinician is actually happily outlined right in here, right side, ectopic pregnancy. So that's an example of what can happen. So why do we recommend screening? Because it's most prevalent in the young adult and adolescent population, because most chlamydial infections are asymptomatic, because you can actually have chlamydial infections that persist for a long period of time. You, you know, there, there have been studies that shown that they're there asymptomatically for three years. Um, so, um, and because when untreated, there's profound reproductive consequences for that. And like I said, it's a huge burden to our healthcare in society. And that's just the treatment. We'll bypass that. Let's move on to um, gonorrhea. It, gonorrhea is, is actually reported even less to the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, than chlamydia is. Um, so they're about half the cases are actually reported because they, you know, they do estimations and they figure that there's probably about twice as many people that actually have the infection compared to the number of um, cases that are actually reported. Um, and this is the second most commonly reported communicable disease in the U.S. Again, asymptomatic people, you know, about two-thirds, 80 percent don't know that they have it. And like with chlamydia, like with that, you can actually screen for it with the use of urine. Um, and it's an extremely sensitive test. It's, uh, you know, it can pick up just a fragment of the DNA that belongs to this organism as well as to chlamydia. And that's just a quick illustration of um, an inflamed cervix versus a normal appearing cervix. Herpes. So herpes has, um, well, when we talk about herpes that we are seeing in the health center, we're talking about uh, genital herpes. And genital herpes can be type 1 or type 2. As long as it's on the genitalia, it's considered genital herpes. However, we don't want to, we want to make people understand there's also um, type 1 that exists oral labially, or, you know, on the mouth itself. And that is what we typically refer to as cold sores. Um, Again, just for you to know sort of a little bit about the biology, it has to, you have to have direct contact in order to acquire it. It enters through the mucous membranes or the, you know, the skin, the epidermis, and you can form vesicular lesions, but m many people have never had any symptoms or are unaware that they've ever been exposed to it. Um, for genital herpes, um, there are about half a million cases that are new that occur every year. Herpes is not reported to the CDC, so um, that's not something that they're keeping track of, but these are estimates where they sort of did titers or blood samples on um, women, and they've estimated that overall one out of four women, ha women has been exposed to um, HSV, either type 1 or type 2. And they've done an estimate of, you know, the um, prevalence based on your ethnic background, and it's about 20% amongst Caucasians, 25% amongst Mexican Americans, and 55% amongst African Americans. And that number actually goes up with age. Um, most of the, you know, so five to 10% of the population has a history of it, but um, that's those who are symptomatic. Um, there's probably an even higher percentage who've never had the um, have, have never had an outbreak, so they're unaware that they're carriers. Now, this slide gets a little complicated. Um, you can have what's called a primary infection, which means a vesicle or a bump appears. You come in to see us. We do the testing to confirm that that's what it is. And if we did a blood test on you, you would not have any evidence that you've ever been exposed to it. So that would be a primary outbreak, first time for you, you're being exposed to it. You could also have 
something, I'm going to jump to the bottom here, a non-primary first episode. And that would be the first time that, again, you see a bump appear. You come in to see us. But when we did the blood test, we say, well, guess what? You already have had this exposure. This may be the first time that you're experiencing it. But this is the first time that, um, but it is not a primary episode because you clearly have antibody to show that you've been exposed to it. So either one of these can be the manner in which it presents. Then what happens is you can then have what we call recurrent infection, um, meaning that the virus gets reactivated because it gets stored in the, um, in the nerve roots and it comes out based on whatever the risk factors are, stress, um, things like that can sort of, sometimes it comes out right before you get your period. For some women, it may just present itself during that time. Your most active, I mean, you're, in general, when you first get the outbreak, it can last for up to three weeks, and we tend to give you antibiotics, for, I mean, um, an antiviral, sorry, not an antibiotic, for a total of 10 days to shorten the duration. For recurrent infections, they can last up to seven days, but with medication, we can sometimes get it down to two or three. Most patients have a recognizable, what we call a prodrome, which is that you know that you're getting it because you start to feel either tingling, burning, or discomfort that present, presents itself. And these are just some of the medications that we use to treat it, but we need to keep going, so. Um, and that's an example of an oral lesion, and that's an example of a vaginal lesion. In 20-year-olds, 50% of new cases of herpes are actually type 1, and that's attributed to the increase in oral sex. That's, um, and that's one of the reasons where, where, you know, when someone tells you they're abstinent, you really want to be sure. What do you mean by abstinent? Are you abstinent but having oral sex? Because you're putting yourself at risk for herpes, in case you didn't know that. Okay, so quickly, yeast infections, um, fairly common. Um, in most cases, it's caused by candida albicans. Um, people who have recently used antibiotics are um, at risk for acquiring the infection. Um, other situations where you may see it is diabetes and pregnancy. People usually have just an irritated and red vagina. It is associated um, with a thick white discharge. Um, and its rates tends to be sort of pretty um, similar, I mean, similar throughout the, in the general population, sort of 20 to 25 percent of people, um, if you screen them at any one time, might be sort of asymptomatically carrying yeast. What we tend to worry about is when you have symptoms, whether or not we need to, um, that's when we tend to treat it. Not, not everyone who has noted is having that is necessarily symptomatic and has a problem. And that's a quick slide looking at, and this is not that great, but it's got, you know, the white sort of cottage cheese like discharge that we talk about. Bacterial vaginosis, that's associated, it's, it's so, a lot of times, you know, because of the web, students will Google information and come in armed with stuff. They're like, okay, I think I have A, B, or C. And I actually find that a helpful tool because they're already familiar with the term bacterial vaginosis. And it's something that's a little bit difficult to understand if you don't sort of understand the ecosystem of the vagina. But in general, the, the vagina has to have a pH of about 3.8 to 4.5 for it to maintain the healthy bacteria that we want it to uh, be the dominant one in there because that pH sort of prevents the bad guys from growing. It prevents the bacteria that causes problems from flourishing. And, you know, yeast or infections can shift the pH of the vagina and then in turn result in, you know, bacteria that normally would not stand a chance sort of taking charge. And that can cause a discharge. It can cause a foul odor that you may notice to be ex uh, accentuated with sexual intercourse. Um, we find vaginitis or vaginosis in about 5 to 25 percent of college students, about a third of, you know, pregnant women, and an even higher prevalence in STD clinics. And the treatment is basically antibiotics and education. Um, it certainly helps if people are um, using yogurt that has the um, active cultures, you know, the acidophilus in it, because you're sort of trying to help get the area repopulated again with the stuff that you want to be there. 
Um, okay, we're almost there, folks. <laughs> so HPV, this is one of the last set of slides. Human papillomavirus, what is it and how do I get it? Well, the human papillomavirus, or HPV, is a double-stranded DNA and it infects epithelial cells. There are about 120 HPV types discovered so far, but only about 35 of those live in the reproductive or anal genital tract. So these are the ones that are of interest to us. And because they're in the genital tract, the method of transmission is, a, is sexual. Um, if, since HPV is a sexually transmitted disease, which is a little confusing sometimes for kids, it is actually the most commonly in, um, common sexually transmitted infection in the United States. Um, there are about six and a half million new um, HPV infections occurring each year. And people always want to know, well, how do I know if I have it? Well, the only clinically apparent disease is genital warts. That's it. Um, if you have genital warts, then that's one way in which we know that you have it. There's also what we call a subclinical disease or a disease that's not vi e easily visible. Well, it's not visible to you without sort of having us further evaluate you. And it requires a pap smear for us to be able to tell that. Um, and sort of like the colposcopy, HPV to detect it, that's sort of all part of the um, assessment of it. But so there's clinical disease and there's subclinical disease. Um, most cases of new HPV of infections occur in 15 to 24 years old, year olds. And the prevalence is really fairly high in the 20 to 24 year old population. They did a study in, of college kids, it's not up here, but they found that what they did is they got kids to enter at the beginning. Some had never had any sexual um, uh, contact and they followed them over two years and they found that by the end of the two year period, um, about 66% of them had at some point shown an exposure to HPV, even if they'd returned back to normal. So it is prevalent, I mean, and what this refers to, rapid acquisition of HPV with the onset of sexual activity, that's what these studies sort of documented was that. And we, we think part of it has to do with the biology of the cervix for young, healthy women. Um, your cervix is sort of more susceptible <laughs> to infections, you know. Chlamydia, HPV, unfortunately, so, and I can explain that another time, but anyway. So we have here risk factors for HPV, sexual activity, exposure to partner with genital warts, not using condoms. Cigarette smoking helps to retard your ability to eliminate the virus because it's your immune system that's going to help you to sort of inactivate and make this no longer an issue for you. And when you smoke, you help to prevent that from being able to clear itself. Um, the average incubation period, so even if you don't know that you've, when you could have gotten it, it's about three months, I tell people. And the most common types that are associated with cervical cancer are 16, 18, 31, 33, and 45. That's a typo, there's no I on the end. The 16 and 18 are the two of the types that are in the Gardasil vaccine, and the other two that are in the Gardasil vaccine is uh, 6 and 11, which protects against genital warts. Um, there's also um, Cerv there's a there's Cervista, which is the other HPV vaccine that's out there that only contains 16 and 18. It doesn't have the type that protects against genital warts. And how do you get it? Well, it's trauma microabrasions that you experience during sexual intercourse. And the, the uh, virus finds a way through the epidermis to get into there. And this goes through the different um, clinical scenarios. I'm just gonna summarize that by saying that um, an active infection would be one in which you develop genital warts, which is easy to see. You can have a subclinical infection where you have these cells being transformed without the ability to see it visibly, but with the cytologic or pap smear sampling, you're able to see the changes. And then you can even have, and this is the frustrating part, a latent infection where the cell is, has the virus in it, but nothing's happening. You know, it's not causing a problem with cell growth being disorganized and it's not being, we're not able to pick it up at all. And that's the part that makes kids scared. Like, well, how do I know? 
like, well, we don't know. And that's an example of genital warts. Not so great here, but you can see sort of like what I call cauliflower or broccoli in appearance. There's just sort of little protuberances that are growing along the genitalia down into here. And we treat that by simply, um, you come into the office and we chemically treat it, or we can even give you an ointment to put on for yourself at home. It usually takes a few. So HPV DNA testing is not recommended for routine STD screening. So when you come to the health center and say, I want to be screened for everything, there's no commercial test to screen for HPV to see if you have it as an STD. We use it to help manage pap smears, and that's it. Um, we don't do it routinely in women before the age of 30. And women who are considering being vaccinated against HPV, I get that all the time. Should I get the vaccine? Do you think I already have it? What difference would it make? If you want to get the vaccine, we can talk about the pros and cons of that. But, you know, there's no point in getting the testing for HPV to see whether or not you have it. And it's not done as part of a sexual assault workup either. So I think we're just about done. Commonly asked questions. What is HPV and can you screen me for it? You guys can answer that. It's a DNA um, virus. And no, you don't get screened for it unless it's indicated clinically. Um, why should I, should I get the HPV vaccine? It's offered for women from about the age of 12 or 13 all the way to 26. That's when insurance will cover it. But we even have people who want it over the age of 26 who pay for it themselves. The downside of getting it on the older age range is simply that you may already have been exposed to the type that you're getting vaccinated against anyway, so it may not necessarily be needed. Will the pill make me gain weight? That's my favorite. <laughs> and the answer is it could, um, because you know the progesterone component of the pill is a little anabolic, and it can sometimes allow people to gain a few pounds with getting it. But you know, the amount of walking you guys do around here, it's almost never that we see weight gain in uh, association with the pill use. And they all want to ask, you know, I want to be screened for all STDs. Well, the primary ones you want to make sure you get screened for every year are chlamydia and gonorrhea. I mean, those are the two. You can get an HIV, if that's one of the ones that we talk about and feel that it's needed. Um, we also recommend that when you, if you have a new sexual partner, think about coming in and getting screened for STDs. And that's it. That's my mom and the kids. The health service is providing you with someone to be there uh, simply for patient comfort. Sometimes, you know, if, if um, most definitely I tell students uh, with a male provider, you should have a chaperone. Um, and with a female provider, it's your choice. It depends on what you'd like. But you're asking um, someone who comes in to accompany you, and that person could potentially be the abusive partner in the relationship, and they want to sit in, and they want to be a part of that experience. It's actually very easy. We just say, no, you have to wait outside. That's not that difficult to accomplish. But, you know, it, it brings up, there are ways around that. Let's say that that's not possible to do. What you do is you tell, <laughs> You tell her she needs to go to the bathroom to get a specimen for urine, and then you meet her in the bathroom and you talk with her. I mean, there are ways around it. You can get that information out without. But in general, we have the right to say you can't stay in here, and that's easily done. Mm -hmm. I, I noticed when you were talking about the history that you do, sexual history, you didn't mention um, asking about whether people are lesbians. Uh, Absolutely. That's actually part of the form itself. It's the, I should have brought you a couple of examples. So the form is actually um, set up so that you can actually talk about your partner, male or female, whether or not you've ever had a male partner, I mean a female partner, and whether or not you're um, currently in a relationship with a male or a female partner. There are also issues of gender identity that do also come up, and that may be something that could be addressed, but we definitely target, you know. We want students to come in and feel comfortable giving us the information that we need to tell them what they need to do to get the best health care. But yeah, you're right, I, left, I um, forgot to mention it in that part of the history, but it is absolutely a part of the form. So do guys get HPV? Yes, they're carriers. And and how do they get treated, or how do they know? So the only way guys would know is if they have uh, genital warts. 
there is no screening test for guys to come in and get the, uh, just like there's none for women commercially available. Um, so the answer to that is they would know if their partner has the problem with the pap smear and is being worked up for that because it means that more than likely he's also a carrier. So very often guys are asymptomatic carriers. There's a quadrivalent vaccine that's come out for guys uh, more recently that was, uh, there's an article in the New England Journal of Medicine a few weeks ago that discusses boys being now capable of getting the vaccine. I'm sorry, guys, sorry. <laughs> guys being, um, are being uh, um, offered the vaccine now. And um, the downside is it's not as effective as the vaccine for the uh, girls. And what is the long-term effect for young men, for men who have HPV? So in general, most uh, men don't know that they have it. The people, and so they, what happens is sort of like that subclinical and then latent phase. It, you, 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 you're a carrier, but it's not showing up. And then eventually, you're, you stop shedding the virus as you're no longer um, infectious. And that's it. And that's the majority of guys. But there's a small percentage of guys who struggle with recurrent genital warts that then puts them at risk for penile cancer, which is uh, the downside. If you fall into that subgroup, that would be one of the long-term consequences. Hey. hey. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have two questions. Sure. Um, the first is, can you talk about a little bit about birth control and decrease in sex drive? Very common. I think that um, most young women who I know have gone off the pill have noticed a substantial increase in their sex drive. And then the second question is, um, I get concerned that in talking about female anatomy, um, one thing that's never discussed is female ejaculation. Mm -hmm. And I think about that in terms of, uh, it's an important topic to bring up because a lot of women who do ejaculate during course, sexual yeah. stimulation or um, excitement are they think that they're urinating and there's a lot of um, psychological uh, actually let me, let, me, let me put a <laughs> slide I'm gonna go back and put one of the slides up because you're bringing up the um, oh I don't know if I can yep I can you're bringing up the skein's ducts and the Bartholin's glands which are the glands that secrete lubrication for women and they can, because of muscle, muscular contraction with um, orgasm, you can actually have them releasing clear liquid that could be sort of confusing to women. And, sorry, I don't know how else to do this. Um, here we go. So what we're talking about, the skeins ducts actually sit up in here. This is the urethra, right? But they're in this area around the opening to the urethra, so it actually is fairly close to the. Do they have them outlined? I don't think they do. A E N E S, right? So it would be up in here, and the Bartholin's glands are down in here, okay? And not necessarily all women, especially when you're on the birth control pill, because what the pill does is it actually causes. Um, it causes. Because it's a synthetic form of estrogen, it's a methylated form of ethanol estradiol, that actually can um, mean that women have um, the synthetic form being the dominant form of estrogen within their system as opposed to eth uh, estradiol, which would be the type that, of estrogen that would be there uh, the most. And so it's not, for some women, what it does is it decreases the amount of vaginal discharge that's noted. It causes um, vaginal dryness as a result of the decrease in lubrication and the discharge that's naturally there. And it can result in sort of a cycle of repeated bacterial and yeast infections because now you have the lining of the vagina that doesn't have the great estrogen effect that's present when um, the estradiol is in the highest percentage. And you can actually end up with, as a result of that, a more difficult time achieving orgasm and so, sort of over time a decrease in sex drive. The other reason that happens is when you get on the oral contraceptive pill, you're sort of 
normally on a day-to-day -day basis, your hormonal levels are varying all the time as they go up and down. So it's that variation, that sort of pulsatile uh, stimulation of the ovaries, of the lining of the uterus that helps to keep everything in balance. And with the pill, what you're doing is you're eliminating that and you're sort of, you're trying to maintain a certain dose above the level required for to inhibit ovulation. And that's got an effect of sort of receptors in this area get down-regulated as a result of that, and it can result in some of these changes that you see. So most times when women have difficulty with decreased sex drive on the pill, sometimes switching it from, um, you know, switching around the progesterone helps, but, you know, when it does you may have to think of something else because getting off of it very often can help to reverse some of those changes and make it better for them. Do you talk with your patients often about um, female ejaculation? Do they come to you with questions? Or no, I actually they're pretty shy. <laughs> right, so that's, you know, it's sort of, you have to build up a relationship. And so usually when they first come in to see me, you know, and in fact, you know, perhaps by the second or third encounter, we'll speak, discuss that. But women who have difficulty with sex would be more of the questions that I get rather than, you know, am I sure, I don't know what's going on kind of thing. But I haven't actually, I don't think I've mentioned that in the last few months with anyone who's come into the office. But it's out there. What are some options for women with um, side effects from other medications with a decrease um, sex? That's a tough one. Um, SSRIs uh, can do that. Um, the medication that you'd use for um, depression, anxiety, um, you know, um, sometimes switching the type of medication that you're on to some a formulation that would have less of an effect might be there. Um, and what I do is I would not change that without having you sort of go back to the provider who's providing you with that medication. There, you know, there's testosterone out there, but I would not recommend it as a treatment for that unless we've sort of gone through, medically speaking, what else could be going on. But there isn't much other than to sort of try and switch around the medications or stop them if possible. But that's a very common side thing. Uh, actually, she never did. Um, I was just wondering, like, a lot of my friends have asked me about, like, menstrual cycle. The menstrual cycle? Yeah, and they end up getting their, like, their periods, like, maybe, like, two times or something in a, one month. Okay. Yeah. Is that bad? Is that is that normal? I don't know. Right. So, you know, the normal frequency for a men menstrual um, cycle would be anywhere from 21 to 35 days. That's the range within which we consider it normal. So if you did have a period at the beginning of the month and then 21 days later you had another one, it's actually okay, even though it's twice within the month. Um, go ahead. But I'm just saying how would the persons like that, you know, like um, sexually active or they're not, you know, doing anything with that, but is this, is it normal? I don't know. I'm not sure I understand. So you want, you want to know if it's normal to have a period every two weeks or no? Maybe like two times per month or something. I'm just wondering if a person had that. If it's okay? Yeah. I don't think I'm getting the question. But I think you probably answered my question, question sorry. Well, I guess what I can do is simply say that if that's not typical for you, then no, it's not okay. Because the majority of women fall somewhere between 28 and 31 days in terms of the time apart before you have your period. So that um, if you have, what, that would be considered sort of intermenstrual bleeding or bleeding in between periods, and that could indicate chlamydia, or it could indicate a whole other set of issues. So that would probably need to be looked at if that's not typical for you. Yeah. Does that help? Yeah, that helps. Okay. Um, I've read a couple articles that say that women with a history of cancer in the family, especially breast cancer, shouldn't go on oral contraceptives because of the estrogen. What do you recommend for these women, or is well, that even true? Yeah. Okay, so she's asking question. about the risk for getting on the oral contraceptive pill with the history, family history of breast cancer. And they actually have studies out that show that there were studies that were done on women who have been on formulations before 1975 in which the estrogen in the pill was extremely high. 
and women who had taken that over the years seemed to be at an increased risk for breast cancer compared to the um, population that hadn't taken the pills. But more recently, the data seems to suggest, even with a family history of breast cancer, that you're not putting yourself at risk because the formulations are 20 and 30 micrograms of ethanol estradiol or estrogen. And there's even one out that now that's 10. And I mean, because of that, so far, the information does not seem to suggest that you should not stay on it uh, or get on it as a result of uh, family history. But I really strongly urge you to check with your doctor because having said that, you may come into me and I may go, oh no, I wouldn't put you on the pill. And it may be for something that, you know, is, it's, it's, it may have to do with the breast cancer information that you're giving me. So I think it does depend. But in general, it's not a complete contraindication. Yeah, that's actually okay. So you're talking about the pills that, she wants to know about the new birth control pills that control your cycle so that you only get four a year. And so whenever you're on a hormone that we're prescribing that allows you to go 16 weeks before having a period, that's okay. Um, because during that time frame, remember that the, the, the ovaries are laying dormant, they're not ovulating, they're not doing anything. The lining of the uterus has really become quite thin. Um, and that's different than if you, as an individual, were only having three or four periods a, a year. We don't like it to happen when it's being done by you on your own. But certainly when we're putting you a prescription, but you're not compromising your fertility for the future, if that's what you're concerned about. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Hold on. Relating to that? Go ahead. Does that affect the like the pregnancy when she in the future? Does right. that affect? So having four periods a year tells me that um, you're ovulating very infrequently. Um, that's what it is. Because the, remember, the period is the marker for ovulation. Not always, I shouldn't say that, but it's in most cases it is. And so when you have a period four times a year, what you're doing is you're only sort of if you're interested in conceiving, you're only giving yourself four times in a 12-month period to try and get pregnant, whereas someone who has appeared every month has you know, three times as many opportunities to conceive. So in terms of, four times a year is okay on your own, provided you check in with your doctor and make sure that that's a, a, you know, acceptable. But in terms of um, what does it mean for you, it may mean that, um, you know, Conceiving will take longer if you're interested in that. Um, and sometimes having a period four times a year, sometimes those menstruations aren't even linked to ovulation. They're just occurring because time has passed. So it could mean other things. So that, you know, I'm assuming you're going to get evaluated for that, but yeah, it's, it's different. Um, when should girls start like, seeing a gynecologist? Because I've heard that they should go like, when they're 16, but then I've also heard that they should, like if they're not sexually active, right. they should wait until they are sexually active to go. So yeah, you know, we sort of recommend sexual activity as a time to come in when you're either initiating or thinking about it, um, contraception, those kinds of things. We use that to have you use that to come in and see us. Um, since pap smears aren't required, you actually, I mean, there are many um, physicians who are adolescent healthcare providers who do perfectly fine taking care of teenagers that they don't necessarily need to come and see us. Um, they're the, um, certainly I think ACOG's gonna re probably take another look at that because we used to say within three years of having initiated sexual activity you need to come in and get a pap smear. That would be the thing that would get you in the door. But I think with any sexual activity you need to see someone, you know, that's really Well, thank you. This has been really fun. You're welcome.